Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming this morning. For those I've not had the chance to meet, my name is John Hybush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to first thank the Simi Valley Police Department and all of the motorcyclists from the Patriot Guard Riders and the Combat Veterans Motorcycle Association for escorting the train car on its final few miles to the Reagan Library this morning. <laughs> These motorcyclists volunteer their time to attend the funeral services of fallen American heroes and to show their respect for them, their families, and their communities. What a fitting tribute to have them here today to honor the over 12 million souls who lost their lives during the Holocaust. I'd also like to thank BNSF Railroad for their donation, which moved this train car behind me from Kansas City to the Reagan Library. Thanks also to our distinguished guests and their families here this morning. I'd like to welcome Keith Mashburn, Mayor of Simi Valley, and Julie Parvin, newly elected supervisor. Allow me first to introduce Rabbi Nolan Leibovitz, senior rabbi from Valley Beth Shalom. It is fitting that he is with us here today and as he is the grandchild of four survivors of the Holocaust. Rabbi Leibovitz. My name is Nolan Leibovitz, and I'm the senior rabbi at Valley Beth Shalom in Encino. Today I not only stand here as a Jewish leader in Los Angeles, I stand here as a grandson of four survivors of the Holocaust. I prefer the Hebrew word for Holocaust, Shoah. Over 200 members of my family were murdered in the inferno of hate that was Nazi Europe. I believe that my grandmothers, both of whom were inmates at Auschwitz concentration camp, might have ridden in boxcars exactly like this one. They might have ridden in this exact boxcar. During the period of darkness expressed by scholar Christopher Browning in his work, Ordinary Men, the final solution was carried out by ordinary people who volunteered to exterminate my people my family, ordinary people, neighbors, participated or fell silent, complicit in the mass murderous behavior that dominated the continent. From my grandparents' perspective, they felt as though the entire world had turned toward evil. Cast the fate of our people into a doomsday scenario. Even this country at first locked its borders. Righteous Gentiles were sparse. Too few Jews were saved. Then the voices of justice, of liberty, of goodness began to ring throughout the world. Young men and women showed up in Europe bearing the patch of this American flag and other flags of the Allied forces. Where there was no hope of help from neighbors, suddenly our soldiers embodied strength and compassion. When the Allied forces arrived, the light of liberty pierced through the fog of darkness. After years of death and suffering, the acts of those brave Americans, their spirit felt jarring, felt different. Our sages teach us in the Talmud that we are to bless God when we encounter another who looks different than us for whatever reason, they feel out of place. And the blessing reads as follows, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, mishaneh habriot, 
Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who creates a variety of different types of people. Thank goodness there were those brave Americans who dared to think differently, to act differently, to reject tyranny, to reject anti-Semitism. After the war, this country welcomed my grandparents and Jews from across Europe to seek a new beginning. And as Jews fought and died for a state of our own in our ancestral homeland, brave American leaders from both sides of the aisle, both sides of our political divide, decided to stand with the state of Israel. President Reagan stood as one of those great friends of the Jewish people here and around the world. President Reagan was one of those great friends of the state of Israel. And now, with the rise of anti-Semitism across this nation and across this world, when members of our own Congress feel comfortable spewing hate against Jews and the Jewish state, an exhibit like this has become all the more crucial. As the survivors, the firsthand witnesses of the Shoah, as the generation passes away, Holocaust education like this has become an imperative for all of us speaking loudly and clearly with one voice, denouncing anti-Semitism and all forms of hate has become necessary at every microphone across the world. For when we look at a boxcar like this, we remember the consequences of hate left unchecked. We realize that history now looks to us to stand up as uncomfortable as it is to stand against a rising tide of public opinion and know that we stand on the shoulders of American giants who didn't rely on popularity and polls, but rather on conscience and conviction. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam mishane habriot. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe who creates people who stand undeterred against the crowds, who aren't afraid to give voice to your goodness in an effort to prevent evil. And let us all say, Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi. In July of 2017, the Reagan Foundation came across a New York Times article about the first traveling exhibition of Auschwitz. It was preparing to go on a European and North American tour. And after doing some research, we determined that the exhibition was being created by a company out of Spain called Musilia. Our chief marketing officer, as she says, blindly sent an email written in English to a Spanish company hoping that perhaps one day it would be seen and even translated. That email was answered three days later by the CEO of Musilia, Luis Ferrio, the same gentleman who conceived of the exhibition to come here. That one email led to four years of conversation, two visits to see the exhibition, one in Madrid, one in Kansas City, and now here we are on the anniversary of Kristallnacht in 2022, announcing the opening date of the exhibition at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. For those of you who might know the significance of today's anniversary. Here's a very short history. On November 9th and 10th, 1938, Nazis in Germany torched synagogues, vandalized Jewish homes and schools and businesses, and murdered close to 100 Jews. Another 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to Nazi concentration camps. The horrible incident was later named Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. 
So it is only fitting that over eight decades later, we have chosen November 10th to announce our exhibition on Auschwitz to ensure days like this are never forgotten. When speaking of the Holocaust, President Reagan said, quote, we must make sure their deaths have posthumous meaning. We must make sure that from now on until the end of days, all humankind stares this evil in the face, that all humankind knows what this evil looks like and how it came to be. And when we truly know it for what it was, then and only then can we be sure that it will never come again. So it is with President Reagan's words in mind that we bring this exhibition to the Reagan Library. It's important for all of us to remember that hatred towards people of all races, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, or disability is something we cannot tolerate, forget, or ever relive. The groundbreaking exhibition coming here, highlighting the atrocities of the Holocaust that's coming next spring will include more than 700 original artifacts and 400 photographs from over 20 institutions and museums from around the world. It has never made its way to the west coast of the United States before. No book, no podcast, no history lesson can prepare one for the impact and the power this extraordinary exhibition holds. It is our distinct honor and our duty, really, to bring it to our community. We are honored to have with us today one of the spokesmen for the exhibition. In 1979, this gentleman was appointed Deputy Director of Communications on the Holocaust. From 1988 to 1993, he served as Project Director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, overseeing its creation. And from 1997 to 1999, he was the president and CEO of what is now known as the Shoah Institute. What a remarkable contribution he has made over the past few decades. Really uh, uh, amazing. Um, sorry. Um, if you would, uh, please welcome our next speaker. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank the Reagan Library for hosting this exhibition. And it's fitting that we're here because of the importance of the role that government can take, first of all, in doing a Holocaust and a genocide, and secondly, in combating it. Let me tell you a little bit about the exhibition, and let me tell you about this particular artifact. We had a opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity, which my colleague Louis took, play, took advantage of, to combine with the museum of the State Museum of, La, of Auschwitz in Poland and bring to the world the artifacts of Auschwitz. Almost two million people a year come to Auschwitz to witness what we call the epicenter of death, the most sacred, anti-sacred place on earth, the capital of evil with a capital E, and the largest Jewish cemetery in the world. And the museum at Auschwitz decided that it was not only time to bring people to Auschwitz, but to bring Auschwitz to people and to allow some of their artifacts gathered when the camp was liberated to travel the world. We titled the exhibition 
Auschwitz not long ago, not far away. We didn't know when we were creating the exhibition that that is a scandal. Not a scandal about how we titled it, but about a scandal into the world that needs to learn this because of the nature of our world today. Auschwitz should be long ago ancient history, and it should be far away something that bears little resemblance to the elements of the world in which we live. But hatred, racism, anti-Semitism, systematic state-sponsored evil, crimes against humanity are not long ago and not far away. They sadly characterize the world in which you and I live. Let's talk about this particular artifact. If I were giving you a lesson on the Holocaust, I would say that the railroad car represents the transition in the nature of murder. We're on the anniversary of what is called by, was called by Germans Kristallnacht and is now called by German historians the Reichspogroms of 1938. Crystal is beautiful, crystal is fragile, and they cleanse the scandal of what happened by naming it crystal. The reality is that the night, the November pogroms, which occurred in the hearts of cities, in which firemen who normally put out fires both set fires and stood idly by to only to make sure that other buildings did not burn in which essentially it was a ravaging of the place of Jews in German society. And it was the moment in which Americans responded most intensely because it was a violation of the most fundamental freedom that we enjoy in the United States, which is freedom of religion. After that, a decision was made that violence would have to be organized and systematic without unintended consequences. And gradually the Holocaust evolved and what it began and it evolved. So that the first stage of killing was to send mobile killers to stationary communities. And to slaughter Jews in village after village, hamlet after hamlet, city after city, men, women, and children often within sight of their homes. And gradually that, and they were not only, the, it was not only uh, the SS Einsatzgruppen that worked on this, but there was the cooperation of local gendarmerie, there was the cooperation of na different nations. In Estonia, no Jew was killed by a German, they were all killed by Estonians. In Lithuania, two out of three Jews were killed by Lithuanians, not by Germans. So it was an opportunity to let hatred ravage, but gradually this became difficult, almost impossible for the killers. They needed to drink afterwards, and then before, and ultimately even during. So what was the transitional point? Transitional point occurred in 1941 and early 1942, when they decided to change the way in which murders took place. They wanted to make the victims mobile and the stationary killing centers factories of death. People boarded this train from their ghettos. It was the last moment that families were together. Often three generations of a family sat together to an unknown destination being told that there was deportation to the east. There was a bucket for personal needs, and there was a bucket for water. Mothers packed diapers, but others did not know what to pack for an unknown destination. And they wrote in this, if you were from Greece, you wrote in this for three to four to five days. If you were from other sections, you even wrote for as many as nine days, in the heat of summer, in the cold of winter. 
And these trains then brought you to what was a factory of death and at Auschwitz, an assembly line of death. You arrived. Suddenly you were told, Rouse, 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 get out, get out. Men were put on one side, women and children on the other. And that was the last moment a family was together. They then faced selection. Selection was to go by a German doctor who with a, almost a baton of a conductor would say to the right or to the left, to life or to death. Women and children, the elderly and the very young were automatically sent to their death and when they needed workers, they sent them to live. If you were sent to death, you went into a gas chamber where there was an assembly line of death. If you went to the live, you then went to a place where they branded you with a tattoo on your left arm and they sheared you because hair could be used as a detonator. Hair was a lining. And then you entered a camp called Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz has one name, but it had three functions, and I want to talk for one moment, because you're going to see in the exhibition all of the three functions. One, Auschwitz I, was a prison camp, a concentration camp, mainly for Polish political prisoners. Auschwitz II was Birkenau, the assembly line of death, the factory of death. And Auschwitz III was the Bunamanowicz complex, 50 different factories of death in which German corporations invested 700 million Reichsmarks in 1942, which was 400 million 1942 dollars, believing that slavery would be a part of the German economy forever. And those decisions were not made at Auschwitz, they were made in Frankfurt and Berlin. Not by SS, but they were made by business people, all believing that this was a way to get cheap labor and ordinary supplies. What you'll see in this exhibition are the different ways in which people endured Auschwitz. The different things that they had, you'll see elementary things like shoes. We don't ordinarily think of shoes as essential to survival, but if you didn't have good shoes, you were frozen in the winter. If your shoes failed, you were the last to arrive. You were beaten whenever you arrived. And then later on the death marches, you could break off your toes like we break off twigs. We're going to see a detailed model of a chimney and crematoria B2, and I want to give you this in detail, Chim crematoria B2 and B3 were designed in a very peculiar and mistaken way. The gas entered from the top. But what they built, and you understand gas rises, and consequently you should put gas in what? At the bottom. So they devised a double cage. You brought the gas to the cage, you drew, took the gas down in a little basket through an, a cage within a cage. You left it there for 20 to 25 minutes and then you could raise it up, let the gas dissipate into the air, and then you could reuse the gas chamber an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. You're going to see the gas mask, the gas mask not worn by the people who went into the gas chamber, but by the SS personnel that dropped the gas in. You're going to see a sketch by a great artist who was his under commando, David Olaire, who's going to show you part of the perversity of deception that was involved. When you see it, you're going to see a Red Cross truck. Now remember that not a real Red Cross truck, a painted Red Cross truck. And remember, when we think of the Red Cross, we think of what? Rescue and help. The Germans, the Nazis, perversely used the Red Cross truck to bring the gas to the gas chamber. 
They used that to deceive the prisoners, to give them a moment in which they thought what? That they were safe and going to be helped and going to be assisted. And then they brought the gas up, they dropped it down this chute, they took it out again and again. Why do we remember Auschwitz? This is the enormous contribution of the two gentlemen and the generations that they represent that sit to my, that sit to my left. Survivors believe that if you remember, if you tell the story, if you scream, if you warn, if you bear witness, then something in the world will change in this type of hatred, this type of fury, this type of racism, this type of anti-Semitism will not occur. That's not true. But that doesn't really, because we've seen that hatred and mass murder occurs again and again and again. But that doesn't mean that those of us who are alive, that those of us who are privileged to know, that those of us who bear witness can agree with what? Amnesia, forgetfulness. We must remember because sometimes we scream at the world to change the world, and sometimes we scream at the world to make sure that the world does not change us. We hope that every visitor who walks through this exhibition will understand their responsibility not so much to remember the past as to transform the present and build hope for the future. And we're here at a library which represents what? A president who brought hope for the future to the American people and the enduring quality of leadership that's required to enlarge freedom in our world. So it's deeply fitting that we're here and it's enormously, sadly, tragically, horrifically important that we visit this exhibition and we understand the responsibilities that come forth once you step through this and you visit the uh, Omni Center, the capital of evil in humanity. We thank you for hosting this exhibition and we are deeply proud of presenting it. Thank you so much, Michael. I've had many privileges in my life, people I've been able to meet, things I've been able to see and do, but I don't know if any of them rise to the occasion of meeting our next two speakers. The first of our two speakers this morning is an Auschwitz survivor who has said, you cannot afford to be apathetic. You cannot afford to be indifferent. When you see evil, do something, speak up. He is with us here today to speak up. He and his family watched Hitler's army invade Poland. He was only 11 years old at the time. Remarkably, he survived six years in the camps. Of the 100 people in his family sent to the camps, only he and his father survived. I'd like now to introduce Mr. David Lenga. David. First, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the Regan Library for this exhibit, enabling us all to see the past. And I would like to take a few words to tell you about myself. I'm a Holocaust survivor from Poland. I was 11 years old when the, bro the war broke out and Hitler mercilessly attacked Poland in what is known 
as a blitzkrieg, a lightning war. The air in Poland, the political air, was laden. It was as thick as a thick cloud you could cut with a knife because everyone that lived there, all the Jews knew what was going on in Germany. They knew Hitler's designs and they knew that they may be next as incredibly as it was because we were rationalizing that this cannot possibly come to pass because Germany was the most enlightened nation on earth. They contributed to humankind. They were the greatest composers, writers, innovators. How could an enlightened people like that embark on something barbaric as the Mein Kampf was setting out? But we were very disillusioned because September the 1st, 1939, I was 11 years old. I witnessed firsthand the onslaught. I happened to have been on a streetcar on an errand when the sirens start blaring and an armada of German attack planes descended very low on the city and indiscriminately machine gunned the population below. And a river of blood appeared in front of me. Panic set in. People were running for their lives. Body parts were flying. And I, 11 years old, was witnessing this horror. I could not possibly understand what is happening all around me. But eventually, I found my way home. My father knew already what was going on, that Poland was attacked, because he heard it in the radio. And he became very somber. He sat me down and my youngest brother and my mom, and he told us in no uncertain terms. He said, I want you to understand that what we have witnessed right now is the beginning of the darkest time in Jewish history. We don't know what's coming next, but we have to stick together for as long as we can and hope for the best. And so immediately what we witnessed as soon as the Germans entered Lodz, what we witnessed was incredible mayhem. The Germans were rounding up the Jewish people from the streets at random. They were hanging them on public squares innocently. They were putting placards on them that they are murderers, thieves, and criminals. These were trumped up charges, of course. These were innocent men. But they did this to intimidate the population and cow the population to their will. I had to witness this along with so many others. What I also witnessed was that when the Germans marched in with tremendous force, the Poles, the Christian Poles, our neighbors, our supposedly friends, our partners in business, they stood with swastika armbands already, welcoming the troops, and the women were welcoming the troops with bouquets of flowers. I was outraged when I saw this. I knew some of these people, and I turned to my dad and I said, Dad, they're committing treason. They're welcoming the enemy. At 11 years old, I, this is what I understood. And my father shut me up very quickly, and he says, Keep your mouth shut and don't say another word. It is dangerous what you're saying. Keep it to yourself. And so I did. Within three or four days afterwards, a jeep shows up in front of our door. 
Three assessment come out with machine guns drawn. They knock frantically on our door and they start screaming, Aufmachen! Open up! We saw this through the window and my mom and I and my brother, we were petrified and my dad that spoke a very good German, he says to my mom, let me go to the door and find out what they want. So he opens the door and they looked at him, one of the soldiers, and he says, are you Abraham Lenga? And he said, yes, I am. You come with us now, right now, this moment. He had no choice. He turned to my mom and he said, Sarah, you take care of the children and I'll be back as soon as I can. They took him to the Gestapo headquarters in Lodz. They interrogated him very briefly and they told him in no uncertain terms that we know that you are the owner of a tannery in the city of Strykov, small town south of Lodz. And we are here to tell you that from now on, you are no longer the owner of that factory. This factory is being confiscated, belongs to the German Reich. But you and your family will be required to work for the German Reich and produce leather, fur, and clothing. And that was an order. My dad realized the futility of objecting. So the only thing he managed to say is, can I please take my wife and children with me? And they said, yes, you can. They needed him. And within a few days, a Jeep came. Actually, it was a lorry that came with German soldiers, loaded us up, and took us to Strykov. And there we were laboring for two years. They established very quickly a ghetto, not with barbed wire, not with tall walls, but a perimeter that they established, and they let everyone that lived in that city know that within this perimeter, they may work and live, and they may not get out from this perimeter without official permission by the German government. That was, in effect, a ghetto. And in that ghetto, we were starved deliberately, we were undernourished, and we had to work. We had no access to a hospital, no doctor, no medicine, Nothing. We were deprived of everything. As a consequence, very many people died because there was no recourse. Once you get sick, you could get no help. For two years, we were laboring and slaving and dying in this place. After two years, the Germans decided to consolidate the small ghettos and take all the able-bodied men and women and transfer them to already bigger established ghettos like the Lodz ghetto, which was a very established ghetto already by that time, 1942, and we were taken there. In order to do so, they proclaimed throughout the city with signs saying that all the Jews have to report to the cemetery, to the Jewish cemetery in Stryko. And so we did, under the threat of death. We had to do it. So whatever meager uh, possessions we could take with us, we took with us, and everybody wound up in the cemetery. And in that cemetery, for three days and three nights, we were kept not knowing what comes next. There was no facility, there was no toilet, there was no water, and there was no food. So people died in the cemetery. That was a deliberate, a deliberate policy of the German government to exterminate the Jewish people. After three days, the Germans came with tremendous amount of trucks. They loaded us up, but before they did that, soldiers stood in front that we had to pass through there to them, and they were assigning the people to go to the left or to the right. And if you go to the left, you go to a certain death or to labor camps, and if you go to the right, you are able-bodied and you wind up in one of the ghettos. Myself, my brother, my mom, and my grandmother, we were let go to work in the Loja ghetto. And so we did. In the Loja ghetto, it was fully established with barbed wire, with guards, with towers, with attack dogs. It was a virtual prison, and there, for two years, from 1942 to 1944, we were slaving and dying of starvation 
And I, for the very first time, experienced the sight as a small child of 14 by that time. I experienced the sight where people were actually, actually dying on the sidewalk as people walked by, children and adults alike. And they were dying of starvation. Naked bodies were thrown on lorries, driven to the outside of the ghetto, not by horses, but by other men. And they were buried in mass graves and there were no trace left behind them. These are the sights, these are the scenes, these are the things, and these are the sufferings that I went through in the Lodge Ghetto. After two years, the Lodge Ghetto, the Germans decided that the Russians are coming too close and they were eliminating the ghetto. And all the Jews were told to go to the substation of Marishin in Poland, the Lodge, and to be taken to labor camps, supposedly to Germany. I decided not to do it, everybody else did, and I was trying to hide out because I felt that the Russians are so close because we could hear in the distance the cannons of the front. And I said to myself, I'm gonna hide out as much as I can and maybe I'll be liberated by the Russians. For two weeks, I was trying to do this and eventually, I could no longer sustain myself because I couldn't scavenge anymore, which I, I did during that two weeks. Then I joined the last contingent in the ghetto called the White Guard. I didn't know what that meant. The people were dressed in white. They had brooms in their hands. They were sweeping the sidewalks. I went out and I pulled the coat of the last one and I said, who are you and what are you doing here? And they said, we're the white guard. And I said, what is that? Well, we're the last contingent of Jews that the Germans left the ghetto to sweep the sidewalks and tidy up after them. So whoever comes in next shouldn't see the mayhem that they created. I couldn't quite wrap it around my head, but I said, you give me a broom and I'll be one of you. That was my way out. And I did. And then after several days of cleaning up the sidewalks, we were taken on capital cattle cars, just like this you see here. We were loaded up and we were traveling for days on end, it seemed, without food, without toilet, without a, a, a means of alleviating yourself. We were squeezed like sardines for so many days and nights and we wound up finally when the, this cattle car stopped. And the minute it stopped, the doors flung open and the Germans, seems like by the hundreds, with, with dogs, German shepherds, teeth so big they could tear you apart, yelling at us with machine guns towards us. Raus, Juden, raus, raus. Get out of this, get out of here. And they were beating us as we were debarking. And in Auschwitz, and I didn't know I was in Auschwitz at that time. I thought I was in Germany because that's where we were promised that we'd be going. So I said to the men in the tarmac, we had striped clothes. And I said, am I in Auschwitz? No. I said, am I in Germany? He says, no, 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 you're in Auschwitz. And I didn't know what Auschwitz was at that time. And I said, what is Auschwitz? And he says, oh, you don't know, do you? And I said, don't. He says, turn around. So I turned around. And he says, you see that big, tall chimney rising up in the air with the black smoke coming out of it? I says, yes, I do. What about it? He says, that's where you wind up. That's where I wind up. Nobody talked to me like that. What does that mean? Where I wind up. I couldn't understand it. Yes, that's where you wind up. And so he, before I knew what was happening, they all rounded us up on the trucks, took us to the camp proper, in the camp, in the camp, I was assigned barracks. I was deloused. I was, my hair was shaven. I was given a striped uniform. And all the people around me looked the same. If my brother stood next to me, I wouldn't recognize him. In Auschwitz, it was horrible. They assigned us to bunks, 
like sardines. We were packed in there. Wooden bunks, no mattress, nothing, just wood. Crammed in those bunks while we were there. I couldn't sleep the first nights because the sirens were alarming. They were, they were sounding alarms constantly like, like fire trucks or, or ambulances. And I said to the people that were there before me, why are these ambulances constantly blaring their, their sirens like that? And they said, they're making constant raids on the camp. I says, raids? What kind of raids? Well, they're sifting through the able-bodied from those that are not able-bodied. And I said, do they have a list? Do they have names that go by? No. No, they don't have a list. It's every, everything is random. And I said to myself, my God, if everything is random, I may be next. I became so anxious to get out of this hellhole of a camp. And there was just no way I could. But one day, one day, I saw two men carrying a huge bucket on a pole. One man in the front having the end of the pole on his shoulder and the other one in the back having his other end of the pole on the shoulder and in the middle was a big, big bucket and I go up to them and I say, excuse me, but what are you doing? Who, who are you? What's happening? He says, we are taking soup in to the holding area of the people that were already selected by the Germans to go to work in Germany proper. And when I realized that this was my opportunity, that's how street smart I was at such an early age. I must have been like 15 years old then. I put my shoulder on the one, in front of one and I said, the three of us are going into this holding area to deliver the soup. They were petrified. No, you can't do that, they said, because they only know there's two of us. I says, just don't say a word. You're going to all be in trouble if you draw attention to yourself. Just let me go. And I wound up in that holding area. And in that holding area, the minute they put on that soup, I disappeared among the crowd constantly, Com to totally. Didn't want to be seen or heard. And within hours, the trains came, and all these selected, including myself, which was not selected, I just surreptitiously found my way in there, and we were taken in to the check to these trains, right here, to these kind of trains, and we were taken away to labor camps in Germany. When I entered that car, and once the doors closed, I could hear a man in the outside screaming, but I was selected, I was selected. That was the man that was really selected, but I took his place by being there. They knew that only 200 men were selected, and they counted the heads. But folks, at that point, I lived through so many years of horror, I had no pity in my heart, and I had no compassion, and I had no room for those luxurious feelings. All I could think of is how do I survive the next moment? How do I survive the next day? I wound up in Germany. I was working hard labor. I was waist deep in wet cement, shaking it with the machine so it sh should stay soft. If I would stumble in any way, or fall in this wet cement, I would die, and nobody would know the difference. The Germans deliberately used us as slave labor. The German machine, the war machine, was supporting it. And we were kept in the total darkness of what is happening to us. After two years, Germany was invaded by the Allies. The Americans came from the west, and the Russians came from the east in great hordes. They invaded Germany, and they decided to eliminate the southern camps and take the prisoners 
those that are still able-bodied and transfer them to the north, to Bergen-Belsen. So I wound up in another car like this from Kaufering, where I was in concentration camp. And on the way, we stopped in a thick forest. And on the opposite track was another train coming, which was a purely military train. And they also stopped right in front of us. And so we stood there, not knowing what to expect. That was in the middle of the day, after hours of waiting and not knowing. An armada of jets, and that was the first time I ever saw a jet plane. They came from the horizon, and they saw the military train, and they thought that both trains were military. And they attacked us with machine guns. These were American planes. They were already in Germany. They attacked that both planes, they put the locomotives on fire, the engines were on fire. We ran for our lives. So many people in our, in our train died by the Americans, not knowing that these are prisoners. And then we decided to jump over, because these cattle cars had no roofs. We jumped over to the thick forest to try to save our lives. We did. Those that did, those that didn't, they remained dead in the train. It was a mayhem perpetrated. The, German, the Americans that attacked us finally realized when they saw all these striped clothing running, jumping over the planes, that these are prisoners. So they stopped and they went away. But the murder, the, the, the mayhem was done. In the forest, we stayed for a few days. We were guarded heavily by the Germans. We didn't know that the war is coming to an end, and it was. It was 1945. And we had no choice but to stay because we were guarded and we were told not to move. One day, after about three days, the Germans disappeared overnight. And we didn't know what was happening. Why are there no Germans? There were so many of them because they knew that the war is coming to an end. So they deserted. They had prepared civilian clothing in their, in their train, their military train. They changed overnight into civilian clothes they shed their military clothing, and they disappeared into the population. And we realized that we are now like sheep without a shepherd. What do we do next? So we decided after a while that we'll form little groups and just head out into the meadows and look for some civilization, some person to talk to, to find out what do we do next. We were bewildered. And so three of us are heading out, and we found in the distance, a, a, a farmhouse. And so we're heading towards that farmhouse. And as we came closer, we were petrified to find that this entire area was swarming with German military. But the patrol saw us three boys approaching, so he yelled at us in German, Halt! Nicht fight again! Stop! Don't go any further! And so he comes towards us as Wer sind Sie denn? Was machen Sie denn hier? Who are you and what are you doing here? I spoke a very good German and I answered, uh, told him what happened, that we were abandoned by the military. And he says, you can't remain here. Das ist ein militärisches Gebiet. This is a military area. You can't remain here. So he took us into the farmhouse where a very heavy German official um, he was a general, he was very bemeddled, and he also sternly looked at us three boys, bedraggled and hungry and, and emaciated, and he looked at us and asked us the same question, what we're doing, and I said, we were abandoned by the Germans. He says, you can't, you can't fly me here, you, you can't uh, remain here, this is a military area, you have to go back where you came from. So I did, with my, three, uh, fr my two friends. And as we were walking about 10, 15 minutes away from the area, a man yells at us, a civilian, an older man, because I could hear in the voice, in German, Burschen, Burschen, geht nicht wieder. Boys, boys, don't go any further. He says, ich komme jetzt zu sprechen zu euch. I, I, I'm coming down there to talk to you. And so he came over and he identified himself as the owner of the farmhouse. And he says, these militaries are leaving momentarily. 
I want you to come with me. I'll put you up in my barn. And so he did. Went around, took us to a barn, and we stayed there. After several days, they were very nice to us, the farmer and his wife. They, they provided us with food. They provided us with clothing. They gave us a chance to take a, a shower on the outside. They had outside showers. And so for three days, we were on that farm. And we still didn't know what was going on around us. The only thing we had a hint was that the farmer told us that the war is coming to an end. We couldn't comprehend that. We didn't even know what that means anymore. And so one day, I was in the outhouse, and my friends from the outside yelled at me, David, come up, come out, come out. We're liberated, we're liberated. So I'm coming out, and I see a tremendous force with tanks that were not German tanks, soldiers that were not German soldiers. And, and, you know, people that I've never seen in my life because these were a black battalion of American soldiers that liberated us. I've never seen a black person in life before because in Poland we didn't have them. And in Germany we didn't have them. And so I was like bewildered. They tried to communicate with us. I tried to communicate with them. They didn't speak my language and I didn't speak theirs. It was very frustrating. And in the midst of all this frustration, a tall, slanky man rises from the middle of the ranks, comes towards us, and he says to me, in unadulterated Yiddish language, he says to me, isn't Eden. You boys, are you Jewish? And I was like flabbergasted. This man is speaking Yiddish. He's an American officer. And I said, sir, excuse me, but you're an American officer. How come you speak such a good Yiddish? And he says, I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> I had no idea what Brooklyn was. I could have been Madagascar. He took us away from there in his Jeep to a DP camp to a displaced persons camp near Landsberg, and that is when we tasted the first fruits of our freedom. And that's how the war ended for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, David. Our next speaker has a similar story in that he, too, survived six years in the camps. In those six years, he was moved to 12 different camps and survived them all. No one else in his immediate family survived. Since 1997, he has been recounting his story at schools to, in his words, prevent another Holocaust and to educate not just the Jewish children, but the non-Jewish children who have never heard of the Holocaust. We are fortunate to have him with us to tell his story. I'd like to introduce Mr. Joe Alexander. Joe? Oh, my name is Joe Alexander, and I'm a Holocaust survivor from Poland. And I survived 12 camps. I come from a small town in Poland, and my father was in business, and we had a very good life until 1939, when the Germans came into Poland. They came to our town a short time after they came in, and they went around the town square and told the people they have 10 minutes to get their possessions and get out in the middle of the square, and they took them away. For some reason, I'll never know, because we lived in the square, and we were the second house from one corner of the square, and the third house was an uncle of mine. So they went after my uncle, they went around, but they left the three houses, which I'll never know why. But when they came to Poland, they divided Poland in two halves. One half was annexed to the Third Reich, to Germany. The second half was Poland on the German occupation. So after they took these people out, 
a rumor started they're going to come back three days later and take the rest of us. So my dad said, we're not going to wait for them to come and give us three or ten minutes. So we moved to a little town about 25 kilometers before Warsaw, a city named Blony, which was the second half of Poland. So we come there, and their life was going on almost normal. People were still in business, but everybody had to go to work. So being there for a couple of weeks, I went to my first camp. That was in 1939. And I worked in a camp where you work during the week. On the weekend, you could go home. But the work we were doing, we were building a canal. He stayed in the water without boots, up to the knee, and that was in October, November, which in Europe, that's always winter time already. So I worked there for a few weeks, about six weeks, and I had some blood poisoning on my arms, on my legs. I went home one weekend, I said, I'm not going back. So Monday morning, the police came to look for me, so my dad said, he's not here, he's supposed to be in the camp. So they went away. And that was the time where they started to build in Warsaw, where the Warsaw Ghetto was going to be. So a short time after they finished the wall, all the Jews within 50, 60 kilometers in the surrounding area of the Warsaw, of the Warsaw had to move into the Warsaw Ghetto. So we moved into the ghetto. You can't even imagine the life what it was. The area they picked out was a very small area, and they put 400,000 people in. So people was dying every day. It was terrible. I lived in the ghetto for about five months, and we found out back home since we left, nothing changed. Everything remained the same. So my parents decided for an older sister and a younger brother and I, we should go home. So to go home, we have to get out of the ghetto, so I paid off the guards at the gate to get out. And we started, we went out and said, the sister and my brother, they take one street, I'll take another street, and we meet on the outskirts of town. So we went through town, and we met and we went home. So I came home and say everything remained the same as it was. Nothing changed. But it lasted three days. I was free for three days. After they being three days there, they came out to another day. All the Jewish men from 16 to 60 reported to the schoolhouse. So I reported to the schoolhouse, and off I went to the camps. And I was going to camp to camp because we were working, the work we were doing was very hard work, and the food you were getting was very little. You got a piece of bread in the morning like this, and a cup of coffee, you went to work. You came back from work, you got a soup, which was most of the time from the, from the peels of potatoes or spinach. And doing the kind of work we did, doing very hard work, building a dam, building sewers, People couldn't survive. That's the only way you could survive, because you work with civilians. If you can manage to get just a little extra food, that's the only way you could survive. So people were dying, and they take, took people, dead people out every morning. So the camp was getting small. So we are, there was, I was in the camps where the, in the city of Poznan. They were in the city and around the city, there were a lot of camps. So the same thing happened at other camps. They combined two, three camps into one. And after a while, the same thing happened at this camp. So I kept moving from camp to camp. After being about seven camps, train arrived, the same what you see here, that car, and we went. The destination we were going takes about five or six hours. We were riding around for three days. No food, no water, no facilities. So finally we arrived in Auschwitz. Came to Auschwitz, 
They opened up the doors. 30, 40 percent of the people were already dead on the train. Whoever could walk, you walked out. And we were lined up in the rows of five. And we met Dr. Joseph Mengele. So Dr. Mengele said there's six kilometers to walk to the camp. He's going to select people to go to the left. People on the left will be taken on trucks. So he went through and picked out sick people, old people, young kids. And I was a little guy, picked me out too to go to the left. <clears throat> but I was already in seven camps. And most of the time, wherever camp I was, I had to go to work. I was trying to get in with the biggest, strongest men. And here I see sick people, old people. This is not the kind of people I like to be with. My luck was it was after midnight. It would have been daytime. I don't think I could have done it. When Dr. Mengele moved further down, I ran back to the other side. If I didn't run back to the other side, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Because the people on the left were taken on trucks, went straight to the guest chamber. So I went back to the other side, and I walked to Auschwitz. I got a shower, and I came out of the shower, and I got a tattoo. Now, you can see here, here, I got a number, 142584. From that moment on, you had no name anymore. That was your name. So I got a tattoo, and there's Auschwitz too. It's called Birkenau. So I went over to, when I went to Birkenau, I was in Birkenau for about four or five months. And then I saw Dr. Mengele two more times in <coughs> Birkenau, but it was daytime and he was, I was far away from where he was, so I got through. And that was the time in 1943 when the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was. After the ghetto uprising, they said they need a big transport, but they, they didn't want to take any people from Poland. They said only one from Greek, Hungary, Italy, anybody. But they were short about 300 people from the, the quota they wanted. So I take now we take people from Poland. So I report and get on the train, and the same thing riding for three days, going back to the Warsaw Ghetto for me for the second time to clean up after the uprise. And we came back, there was not, not one building was left, only remaining walls. And our job was to take down the walls brick by brick and clean them up and put up in stacks of eight, 10 feet high. After working with this for a while, the typhus broke out. Anybody who went, into the, went to the hospital, I didn't know anybody who came out. I got the typhus, the fever, typhus to get high fever. But I didn't go to the hospital because I had a, we called a couple, like a foreman. He was a German man, but he was also a prisoner. So he didn't care if we worked or didn't work. So when I got this fever, I was sitting behind those stacks of bricks like this for about three days until I got over the fever. Then I went back to work. Going back to work, after a while, the Polish underground attacked our camp. They were trying to free us. So they were fighting all night, but they were unsuccessful. So the next morning, they took us out. And we were the job to get out of the city. They said they were afraid they were going to attack us in the city. So we got out, and they put us up on a big field where farmers graze their cows, and the ground is very moist. Put us up on that field. Whatever means you have, a knife, a spoon, anything you could dig up, some mud. And you take the bottom of your shirt, and you squeeze the mud to get a little water. So stayed overnight. The next morning, we we're on the march. And we come to the city where there's a river. They let us go to the river to get some water. 
Two of our people went a little too far into the river. They thought maybe they wanted to get out on the other side and escape. They got shot, got killed in the river. So we got some water and we walked. We came to the next town, it was the same river, but this time we said you can only go 100 people at a time to go to the river to get some water. So we got some water and we started walking. And that day was very heavy rain was coming down. Walking, we couldn't even walk. We were soaking wet from the, from the rain. Finally, until we arrived in the railroad station, and at the same time train arrived. And we got on the train, and we were three and a half days on the train with no food, no water, no facility. We went to Germany. Came to Germany to a camp named Dachau. Dachau was the first camp Hitler built in 1933 for political prisoners. Then he turned it into concentration camps. So I came to Dachau for about two weeks. I didn't do anything because they were establishing 12 camps within 50, 60 kilometers in the surrounding area of Dachau. So then I was sent to camp number one, and I was working for a farmer digging potatoes. That lasted about three weeks, and I was finished there. Then I was sent to another camp to a city of Landsberg on Lech, which I was, was camp number seven. So I came to camp number seven. So there, uh, we were a few of us. We were in the camps already over four years. We had the privilege of getting the better jobs in the camp. So friends of mine worked in the kitchen, some of the police, and this is the only camp I was where women was in the same camp, but they were blocked off by a wire fence, but we went to work together. I got a group of 10, we were five girls and five boys, and I worked at the, right outside the fence for the, in the kitchen for the German guards. And there were two men in charge of the kitchen, two German men, but they were very good to me. So I was there, working there, until April 28, all the sub camps had to go back to Dachau. So we came back to Dachau, stayed overnight, and they, we went what they called a dead march. They supposed to take us in the, in the mountains in Germany, it was a ski resort, garnish, and they supposed to kill us in the mountain. But we walked for two days, and we crossed a little bridge, the little bridge was blown up, so the group was divided in two halves. I was in a half, was in a village, and there was a little forest in the village, so they took us into that forest, and they asked for volunteers to take the sick people into the farmers to put them into the barns, and during the night, the guards disappeared. We didn't know till the next morning. The German police came and they took us into that village and they disappeared. It was in the morning, about between eight, nine o'clock. So we just walked around the village and see what's, what happened next. And so we walked around until about 12, between 12 and one o'clock, American tank moved in and we were liberated. When the tank moved in, after the tank were the American troops. So they're trying to block off that village, not to let anybody out. But we were a group, nine of us, we were in the camps over five years. So we didn't want to get blocked in. We broke through and started to walk. And we walked about a kilometer or two. There was a, gym, a bakery. We went into the bakery and everybody got a bread. You were okay. And we walked. A little further, we come to, this, to a city named Bartels, and we see three American soldiers. They were walking, but they, they were Czechoslovakian in the sand, but they were walking, they couldn't walk. They had to hold on to each other. They were so drunk. But the clothes we were wearing, they asked us, oh, are you Polish? So yes, so they took us in to an underground bunker. You couldn't see the end of it. So 
the bank bunker and we changed clothes. Everybody took a backpack and put some food in. And then we had, they had a big row of bicycles chained up, they broke the chains, so everybody got a bicycle. And then we have to find a place where to stay. Because when the American troops came into that village, they brought all the people into that city, they made a DP camp. It used to be a German Air Force base. But we didn't want to go to the camp, so we hopped over. We couldn't get out of the street. It was 6 o'clock, it was curfew. So we hopped over about three or four fences, and we came to a German inn, and it was taken over by the American troops. In the back of the inn was an empty house, so we took over, we moved into the house. And lived in the house about 10 days. They came out to order anybody who lives outside the camp just to move into the camp. So we moved into the camp, and we were taken back to another DP camp in Munich, to Munich. But you were free. You, wanted, you could live at the camp, or you can go any place you want to go. So I stayed at the camp for about three days, and then I moved back to Landsberg, where it was camp number seven was. And Landsberg was the large, one of the largest DP camps in Germany. There were a lot of DP camps. So we went, I went, and a couple of friends of mine went back and went to the camp. We registered at the camp. And they gave us a room, and I stayed overnight. And the next morning I moved out to a farm and I lived in a farmhouse. The reason we went to the camp to register is because there were a lot of DP camps in Germany. So we all went to the camps to register in case anybody of your family survived. So that's why I went over to check the list. Because, you know, I'll tell you, when I got out of the Warsaw Ghetto, I left my parents, two sisters, and one brother in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I still, today, I don't know what happened to them. So that's why I went to register the camp, but I didn't want to live in the camp. So I lived about six weeks and in, the, in the farmhouse, and I went back to Poland to see, they went to my hometown, go to the house, to see if anybody from my family came back so there were survivors living on the f second floor, and the first floor were on Polish people. But they said no, no survivor, nobody from my immediate family came back. Only a cousin of mine who came back, he was three years younger than I. We were separated when Dr. Mengele and came, told me to go to the left in Auschwitz. And he, I was with him and two of his father's brothers. So he was the only one who survived, but he was in a different town. And that was very bad for survivors who came back in Poland, because the Polish people killed a lot of survivors. Because when they took the Jews out, they moved into the homes. Now survivors are coming back. They didn't want to give up the homes. They were killed a lot of survivors. In one town named Kelsen, they killed 42 survivors in one town. So the Polish people who live in my house, they asked me if I'm going to stay, they'll move out. I told them, don't bother. I went my cousin, get my cousin, and we went back to Germany. And I lived in Germany for four more years, because you couldn't go any place. You didn't have a passport. You have to wait until some, some country opens up. So after four years, Canada said they're going to take some people. So I went to register, then you have to wait until they call you. Took a long time, I didn't hear from many. And in the meantime, a friend of mine lived in the next village, he said, now came, he said, yo, you can go to Munich now, you can register to go to America. So I went to Munich and registered. In a very short time, I got a note to go to be checked out by the American doctor and then the FBI check you out. And I got a note to go to get the boat, Bremenhaven, it's a port in Germany. And I got the boat to come to America. And I arrived in the United States on May 30, 1949. 
Yes, I came to New York, and everybody had to have a sponsor. You had either had some relatives or you got organization to sponsor you. I didn't have any relatives here, so I was sponsored by a Jewish organi organization named Joint. And my contract was Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So I went to Harrisburg, and I worked for a man. I worked as a tailor, because I had a cleaning store, and he also a tuxedo rental. And a man that the father couldn't be better he was to me. So I was there for about six months, but then the, the cousin who survived had an uncle here in Santa Monica. I came in May, and he came in October. He came to Santa Monica and told the uncle that I'm in Pennsylvania. We were the only two survivors from both of our families. So the uncle called me a few times. I should come here. So in 1950, I came to California, and so here I am now. Thank you, Thank you so much. You are. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Joe. Before we wrap up today's program, there's one more person I'd like to recognize. We are so honored to have with us today Gordon Sundland, the former United States Ambassador to the European Union. Now, why is he with us here today? Well, his family escaped Nazi Germany as well in 1939. He is a passionate advocate for speaking out to educate young people to never forget and for deniers to learn the truth. And to help in this mission, he is the presenting underwriter that's made, that has made it possible to bring this important exhibit to the Reagan Library. May I please now introduce to you Ambassador Gordon Sundland. Gordon. Thank you, John. Uh, after those testimonials from the two survivors, I'm going to be extremely brief because there's nothing that I can say uh, that really could follow that. Those were incredible stories uh, told by two incredible men, and there are millions of other stories just like that. So all I want to say is thanks to the Reagan Library for doing this. My parents would be in incredibly proud if they were both with us today. And I'm hoping that thousands and thousands of people over the next year when this exhibition uh, takes shape will have an opportunity to see and hear these stories. Thank you all for being here, and I'm very much in, in debt and gratitude to the library. Thank you. I uh, am now on to perhaps what you came to see today, the installation of the train car on the Reagan Library property. Before that, though, I want to officially announce that the Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away exhibit will open at the Reagan Library on March 24th, 2023. This exhibition sells out everywhere it goes, with waiting lists routinely in the thousands. So we encourage everyone to start purchasing their tickets today. Now, tickets can be pre-purchased at reaganlibrary.com slash Auschwitz. Um, that's reaganlibrary.com slash Auschwitz. Thank you so much for coming today. Our speakers today are happy to speak to any member of the media who'd like to speak one-on-one -on -one with them. Again, thank you so much. Let's install the train car. <laughs>